Professor Dawkins, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to speak with me. You are not in the habit of talking a lot about yourself personally. It's funny, I've always, in the interviews, you'll deflect a little bit from that. And we'll talk about the sciences, we'll talk about religion, we'll talk about God. But when people will ask you a personal question quite often, you almost seem to blush a little bit like, who, I don't want to, who wants to hear about that? That's my idea. <laughs> And yet, uh, people seem to be fascinated. I mean, I'm fascinated. Who are you? How, how are you raised? Where do you come from? What are your interests? Does that seem a little odd to you that so many have a fascination with Richard Dawkins? Well, it seems odd to me that I have decided to write an autobiography in view of what you said, which is perfectly correct. I mean, it had to be an uncomfortable thing. You're, you're putting these private moments of your life now officially down on paper. Yes. Uh, it I, it does make me feel a little bit embarrassed because exactly the reason you said, you know, who on earth wants to know about that? Uh, but um, I have been persuaded that it might be of interest to at least some people. And so I did write, this is just the first of two volumes actually. This one only takes me up to the age of 35 when I wrote The Selfish Gene. It was quite fun to do so. It was quite fun to talk about things with my mother uh, who, re who remembers things very well from long ago. And so I, I didn't exactly formally interview her, but I kind of had conversations in which I made notes and, and um, used them. You dedicate the book to your, your sister, your mom, and your dad. A very close family union? Yes, definitely. Uh, my father died quite recently at the age of 95. My mother's still alive. Uh, she's 96. And um, I'm very close to my sister. Yes, we are a close family. Was your father a believer, a non-believer? No, no, he was a, he was a non-believer. So for the uh, memorial service, was it a, a purely secular event? Yes, it was. Uh, we had um, people speaking, we had uh, a bit of poetry, a bit of music. Uh, we had a string quartet uh, that was the string quartet of my father's great nephew. Uh, he's the leader of a string quartet and he brought it along to play very beautifully. Um, and they played several pieces, Schubert, Tchaikovsky. Well, I've heard you speak about uh, atheist funerals or secular funerals in the past. Just in passing, you were talking about how that uh, many believe that uh, these types of ceremonies don't mean anything without the, uh, the idea of God. But actually, the opposite is true, because we're celebrating one's life. It really can be a tremendously moving moment. I'd long noticed that when I go to funerals, even religious funerals, the bits that are moving are the bits that where somebody does a eulogy or somebody uh, remembers the dead person or reads a poem that the dead person loved. Uh, those are the bits you really remember from a funeral service. The prayers are so standard. I mean, they're just the standard prayers that come out. And when, when the vicar speaks about the dead person, you can tell that usually he never really knew them. He's just sort of doing, going through the motions. Of yeah, it's like a hired gun who yes. came in to say something yeah. poetic and then he, yes. he leaves. Yes. You weren't born in the UK. Tell me about Africa. You spent your formative years having some pretty amazing memories. I'm not sure how formative necessarily the years from naught to eight are compared to later years. Uh, I don't know quite how formative my African years were. Uh, I look back on them with great nostalgia and pleasure. Uh, I'm not sure they were that formative. I think my years at Oxford were probably more formative. Really? Much later. So had you not been born in Africa? Do you see yourself as being a naturalist, a scientist? I'm, I'm curious about that, that general question of how, how different it would have been if things had changed, not just for me, but, but, but for everybody. And there's a sort of musing uh, at the end, in the last chapter of the book, about the fork in the road. And, and suppose you go back in time and imagine taking a different fork. Uh, I don't know how different my life would have been if I hadn't been born in Africa and spent my early years there. But there are probably other things that are even more um, dramatically affecting of the future. I grew up playing with puppies and kittens. You grew up playing with baby lions. I mean, that's an amazing, I have this born free sort of an image in my head of you frolicking with, with the lions in Africa. This was a common thing for you, yes? It wasn't common. I mean, I, I, my mother records that I did have one episode of playing with, with baby lions, yes. But we, we didn't actually keep pet lions. Somebody else did and, and I was allowed to play with them. Are you an animal person? 
I like to think so now. Yes, I mean, I, I'm deeply interested in animals and, uh, and I'm fairly knowledgeable in a sort of academic way. Now, how about a personal way? I mean, do you have dogs? Do you have cats? Oh, yes. Do you have a parakeet? What do you yes, mean? Yes, yes. Um, we have two dogs, and I love them very much. <laughs> what are their names? I have to know. Uh, Tycho and Cuba. Tycho is named after Tycho Brahe, the great Danish astronomer who did the observations that Kepler used to work out the planetary orbits. Uh, and Cuba is, uh, well, she's called that because, because she's Havanese. I considered naming this interview in no particular order because that's sort of the nature of the conversation I want to have today. I'm just pinballing around from different things. You said in the book something about, about children and fairy tales. I'll just quote it. You said, I can't help wondering whether a diet of fairy stories filled with magic spells and miracles, including invisible men, is educationally harmful. Whenever I suggest such a thing today, I get kicked around the room for seeking to interfere with the magic of childhood. So. No Santa Claus, no Tooth Fairy? Well, I mean, I'd like to know what you think about that, because I, I, uh, I, I love the childish imagination, I and mean, I think that the imagination should be fostered in, in childhood. But somehow, Tooth Fairies and Santa Claus don't seem to me to do justice to the, the power of the imagination, and uh, I sort of feel somehow the, re the real world has, is fodder for imagination which is rather greater than that, or rather greater than fairy tales in, in which um, things turn into other things, frogs turn into princes, um, pumpkins turn into coaches. Um, somehow, supernatural magic like that isn't so magical as the, the, the real world of science. And it also fosters a false belief that things can be turned into other things just like that. And it's rather a profound lesson, which probably would benefit childhood, that it's not physically possible for um, things to turn into other things that are both complex in interesting ways, like pumpkins turning into, into coaches. There are very good reasons why that can't happen. And I think I remember, as a child, believing that if you wish for something hard enough or pray for something hard enough, however miraculous, it might happen. And I think that is a bit pernicious, but I'm very ready to be talked out of that. I mean, I, I, I know I'm in a minority there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on the subject either. I, there's a fear that if you teach a child the fact of Santa Claus and then the child grows up to realize that Santa was a fairy tale, a myth, uh, a falsehood, that there's a trust issue there. They're all, but at the same time, I'm also convinced that if you treat it with a light touch, if it's part of your um, stirring of the imagination and you're not necessarily teaching it as fact, there may be a place for it. I, I'm no real expert yes. on the subject. Yeah. Um, you seem to share with Carl Sagan a, a wonder at looking at the universe. When I, I read your work, when I hear you speak, you've you know, the magic of reality. It's an amazing universe we live in, and you seem to really uh, feel the privilege of being alive. Well, you could say that again. I mean, most definitely, and that's sort of what I meant when I said that's so much more magical in a, in a real sense than uh, pumpkins turning into coaches. I mean, I've, I've written a whole book called Unweaving the Rainbow, which is an attempt to, um, to get away from the idea that that scientific understanding destroys the poetry of the, of the rainbow and everything else. Here's the challenge that I have. I, I came late to the understanding of a universe that was not 6,000 years old, created by a space king, right? I came late to, to the Big Bang and to natural selection and all of this, and I am catching up. How does the civilian participate in the conversations that have to do with these complex issues. Scientists of one type, like biologists, have just the same problem talking to scientists of another type, like physicists. There's a whole lot of knowledge which uh, is very difficult to understand, and in the case of modern quantum physics, uh, very few people do really understand it. So uh, I, I think that, that we all have that problem, and there's a certain I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish to say that we take it on faith, but uh, we, we know 
the, the methods of, of science are tested and tried, and although I don't understand physics, I know that physical experiments are done with meticulous care, and they are, are repeated by other physicists. And if anything isn't really true, it is going to turn out not to be true in subsequent work. So, although I don't understand physics in any detail, I believe it works because it's been shown by the tried and tested methods of science to, to work. And so I think the same should be true of a layman for any science, that, that you, you know the methods of science, peer review, repeating experiments and so on, um, double-blind experiments. You know that the methods of science are designed to work and designed to avoid deception and self-deception. So um, although you may not be able to, and I may not be able to participate in, in the detailed discussions, I think we kind of know where reality is. There are people out there who have a PhD in some science who also believe in the young earth, Adam and Eve, and a floating zoo, and all of these types of things. How does this happen? How does someone who is a champion of science, or supposedly a champion of science, also continue to believe in mythology and fairy tales? When you say they have a PhD, you need to look at which university they have a PhD from. <laughs> yes, yeah, And sure. also which subject, because it's, it's often something like marine engineering or something. It, it, it's often nothing to do with, the, um, with, with biology, which is, or, or, or geology, or any uh, relevant science. The um, religious community is often very, very uh, quick to put these types of people in the center stage under the spotlight. It's difficult to often know the difference, who is, who is a legitimate scientist and who is not. They play on that, of course, yes, and it's, it's very easy to trot out somebody who's, who they say has a PhD and is, and is a real scientist. Uh, the, the mistake, I think, is to argue from authority rather than to argue from, from evidence. And uh, the evidence in the case of the age of the Earth is totally overwhelming, um, I mean, from all different sorts of sources. Uh, there, there's no question but that the the universe and the world are, are billions of years old. Uh, and so do, it doesn't matter whether somebody has the, the letters PhD after, after his name, um, the evidence doesn't support him. Back to the memoir, I want to talk about your childhood. You sang in the choir, Are you a musical person? I've got a natural ear for music in one rather limited sense. Uh, I can uh, play a melody on an instrument if, if, I can, if I can whistle it, if I can sing it. So my fingers kind of know where to go in the same way as when you're whistling a tune, your, your mouth and lips and tongue know where to go in order to get the tune right. Uh, but that's a very limited gift and it actually pro proved to be a bit of a handicap for me in my music learning because it was so easy for me to play by ear that I was lazy and never bothered to learn true musicianship. I, I was never very good. I can read music, but I never been very good at reading music. I'm not very good at improvising. I can't harmonize. All I can do is play melodies, and that's a pretty limited ability. Forgive the phrasing of this question, but this is in the book. Please tell me, what is the Dawkins organ? Ah, um, <laughs> in, in animal behavior, you often need to uh, record what the animal's doing uh, in such a way that you can then quantify things and time intervals between things and the order in which things happen. So you want to know what the animal did and when. And in the early days of ethology, the study of animal behavior, people had a notebook and they wrote down what happened and they might have had a stopwatch and they might have written down the time. And then they had uh, paper recorders which had paper on a drum, a roll of paper on a drum, and you pressed keys and little pens moved on, on, on the paper to show what the animal did. Well, with the advent of computers, we wanted to have a kind of computer version of that so you didn't have the enormous tedium of going through the paper roll and transcribing it. And so I devised this thing called the Dawkins organ. Uh, and the idea was that you have a little organ, a little ele electronic organ, which is extremely simple box with buttons on. And each button plays a note. And that's, you could do that with two transistors. It's a, it's a very, very simple piece of circuitry. So each button plays a different note. The trick was to program the computer to recognize the note, give the computer perfect pitch in effect. And so the Dawkins organ was an extremely cheap instrument for doing this. 
just a box with buttons and two transistors. Um, and the software did all the, uh, all the recognition. And I then wrote a lot of supplementary software to um, print it out and make it neat and, you know, label the behavior patterns with their names. And um, it didn't, it, you began with a, with a calibration scale, simply play, play all, all the notes uh, on, the, on the organ in, in order. The computer then learned those frequencies, those, those pitches, and tied them to um, a set order of, of, of behavior patterns. It was used quite a lot in, in its time. I'm sure it's not used anymore. Computers have certainly changed over the decades, yes. have they not? Yeah. It is pretty amazing to see what we are able to do. You were able to connect with a worldwide audience via Twitter. How often do you tweet every week? Oh, every day. Are you addicted? Are you a social media um, addict? Uh, it's Possibly, but I, like, <laughs> like previous addictions, like my addiction to programming, I'm going to get over it. Well, you know, it's a great way to communicate thoughts and ideas. It's a great way to stir the pot and get information out there. Do you tweet yourself or do you have someone do it for you? I do it myself. You're actually behind the name Richard Dawkins. Yes. Because we have to wonder if there's a minion back there who's, <laughs> you know. Who's well, um, people on my foundation do, do it as well, but, but I do my own. You were 11 years old when a very uncomfortable moment happened. Uh, it's in the book, so I'd like to bring it up, if we may, um, where you were inappropriately touched by a schoolmaster. And it's a very difficult story for you to tell, I'm sure. I mean, it's a very transparent moment where you're dealing with, uh, with something that is, uh, you know, uh, what could be for many a life-altering moment. Um, talk to me about why you felt compelled to tell the story and, and what your thoughts are on it today, if you would. Well, my thoughts on it, I mean, it, it, it was very brief. It only lasted about 15 seconds. Uh, and it, it was not painful. Uh, it was disagreeable, it was embarrassing, it was very unpleasant. Um, but it didn't ruin my life, uh, very far from it. Uh, it has happened to many of my schoolfellows at the same school. Uh, the master concerned later committed suicide. Nobody, I mean, I don't know why. Um, and that was traumatic for us when he committed suicide. Um, the actual experience of being felt by him uh, was not life-changing. And I've said it wasn't life-changing, and I've come in for a lot of stick for doing that because various people have read it as trivializing the, exper the experience of child molestation. They believed you were minimizing. And they believe I was minimizing. I was doing exactly the reverse, in a sense. I was minimizing my own experience because I felt that to do anything else, to, to say that this was life-changing or ruin my life, um, would be to minimize the experience that others have had where it really is life-changing and is a curse on the rest of their life. Uh, people who are molested, perhaps by a father or an uncle or a grandfather or a stepfather, um, for years, and are unable, or a priest, are unable to um, uh, get anybody to believe them or frightened to tell the story, these really are horrible experiences and people have had their lives literally ruined by that experience. For me to have claimed that my life was ruined by 15 seconds of discomfort uh, would be to minimize and trivialize uh, the very real horror of other people's experience. You went through a time of religious fervor. You were a kid, but you were all in, right? Did you believe in Jesus Christ? Mm, I was never so keen on that. I mean, I, I, I'd sort of worked it out that because there are so many different religions and it was a pure accident that I happened to be uh, baptized and confirmed into the Anglican faith rather than into Islam or Roman Catholicism or something. Um, so uh, I was never a very enthusiastic Christian, but I did go through a phase of uh, being a sort of deist sort of believing, really because of the living world, I mean, because, because of the, the, the beauty and elegance of living, cr living creatures. And Something out there must have created so, all Yes, I mean, I was sort of fooled by, the, by the, uh, the, the feeling that if something looks designed, it is designed. I, I, had, I was yet too young to see through that, that argument. Um, so, I, yes, I suppose I, I went through a phase of believing in that, yes. In the book you talk about praying, you prayed quite a bit. Yes, and well that was when I was confirmed, and, and I was confirmed into the Church of England at the age of, I think, probably 13, and uh, went to 
confirmation classes with the vicar, who was a nice avuncular man, and um, got, I mean, I was, I, I didn't see through it at that time. It, 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 it all, I mean, I, I realized I didn't understand it, but I thought that the reason I didn't understand it was that I was too stupid to understand it, not that it actually was a very stupid thing he was saying. But you're not praying to the Christian, you're not praying to Yahweh, you're just praying to the creator of all well, things. Well, no, at that time when I was confirmed, I probably was praying to the Christian God, yes. And it didn't take long before you began to see that, what, Darwin's idea was much better than... Yes, I mean, I, I got out of my, my deist phase when I, when I finally understood Darwin, yes. Darwin is vilified by so many. Of course, I've even heard the Hitler analogy used. Darwin, Hitler, Darwin, Hitler. People seem to play the Hitler card wherever you go. The look on your face when someone brings up the Hitler argument in an interview is priceless. How amazingly frustrating must that be for you? Yes, um, the name of Darwin is not mentioned once in Mein Kampf. Um, it's <laughs> yes. doubtful that Hitler had any understanding of Darwin at all. Uh, the social Darwinism which Hitler professed, um, not under that name, um, is a travesty of Darwinism. Uh, it was fashionable in the 19th century, in the early 20th century. Uh, it's no longer fashionable. Um, it's, um, uh, there is, it, it's, a, it's a complete nonsense to tie uh, Hitlerism to Darwin. Isn't Hitler just a hot button, right? It's a, ver it's a grenade that people throw into a conversation to try to vilify the opposing y yes. point of view. Yes, it is. And uh, I don't, in many cases, a great many cases, it seems to minimize the position of the person who uses it. It seems like a, a moment of desperation to me. Uh, you're as bad as Hitler. Yes, yes, it, it, that's, that's fairly common. Nevertheless, Hitler existed. He did the terrible things he did. Uh, we, we can't just stop talking about him. He didn't do the things he did because of atheism, though. No, no, of course not. No, he wasn't even an atheist. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, that's particularly irritating is the, is the attempt to tar atheists with the brush of Hitlerism. I mean, Stalin may have been an atheist, but even that's doubtful. Uh, but whether he was or not, he certainly didn't do what he did in the name of atheism. When you wrote The Blind Watchmaker, you addressed the, and probably beforehand as well, you addressed, you addressed the evolution of the eye, right? Is the, the eye is too complex to have evolved, is what we continue to hear. And you have demonstrated, even on video, you've demonstrated that the eye does fit the evolutionary model, yes? Very strongly so, yes. And here we are in the year 2013, and you are still having to address the claim that the eye is too complex to have evolved. 30 years plus later, there seems to be nothing new under the sun. Do you feel like any headway is being made on these arguments out there? Well, um, I've done it in three of my books, The Blind Watchmaker, Climbing Mount Improbable is the book where I really go to town on the, on the eye. Um, uh, the chapter called The Fortyfold Path to Enlightenment. Um, it is a very good example because it's proverbially complicated. It's proverbially like human machines. It's very, very like a camera. Uh, and it proverbially looks designed. Um, it's illuminating in another respect in that it's actually rather bad design. There are, there are things about the eye which no engineer would get away with. Uh, you know, if you, if you worked for Leica or Canon or Nikon and you produce something like the human eye, you'd be instantly fired, <laughs> as, as Helmholtz himself actually said, so something like that. Um, and it, it's, it's beautiful in, as an example because you can point to all the various eyes throughout the animal kingdom. There are about nine different optical designs of eye which physicists can think of and all, all nine of them have been adopted by different animals. Um, in many cases in very imperfect forms. I mean, the human eye forms a rather good image, so good that you can read and, and, and see precise detail. Um, but if you look at invertebrate eyes of various sorts, you see the same design of a camera eye with a retina at the back, sort of cup shape with a retina at the back and some sort of lens at the front. Um, but very, very crude. There are pinhole eyes uh, with, no, with no lens. Um, there are cu cup eyes with no, no lens that just indicate vaguely where the light's coming from or wh where the shadow's coming from, but don't really form anything you could call an image. Um, and there are other eyes of, of remarkable precision. So you can see the whole 
uh, range of qualities have I laid out. Uh, these, of course, are not ancestors. These are all modern animals we're looking at, but they show what ancestral stages probably looked like, and you could make a complete series of plausible ancestral intermediates by looking around the modern animal kingdom and extrapolating back in, into the past. There have been uh, mathematical models suggesting that the evolution of the eye could have been extremely rapid, I mean remarkably rapid, something like a, less than a million years to get from just a plain sheet of retinal cells and no lens up to a modern eye, uh, like, a, like a camera eye. Observable. It's provable. And yet we continue to hear the eye is too complex to... Yes, explain. I mean, I think people who say that just haven't, haven't read it up. I mean, they just... They just um, but believe what they're told by some preacher. And, and you, feel, you feel this all the time, though. I mean, I see you on television, and you're interviewed often by a theist, and you hear, where do your morals come from? Yes. And you've killed God because you are arrogant and wish to be God yourself. And um, the personal experience arguments, all of the argument from authority, which you mentioned earlier, all of these things continue to come up. And the arena of ideas and the debate arena must be a frustrating thing. Yes, it is, but I think we are making progress. I mean, the people who you're, you're quoting, we may not make progress against them, but if this is a public interview, a public discussion, uh, with hundreds of other people listening in, um, probably we're influencing many of those people. We may, not find, we may not change the mind of the person we're actually having an argument with. I'm watching you doing an on-camera interview with Wendy Wright. And I just want to say how impressed I am that you did not burst into flames during that exchange. <laughs> I have seldom been so frustrated at someone. Yes. Right? She says, show us the evidence. Yes. And you provide the evidence. And her response is, show us the evidence. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I was under strict instruction. That was a television program that I was making for Channel 4 in Britain. And I was under strict instructions from the director to to be polite and to, and to not burst into flames as you You were direct, you, but you were polite, you were cordial, you were extremely patient. And the, you know, the mannequin stare that you receive in return, she's sending, she's not receiving. Is it because her desire to believe is simply greater than her desire to know? Do you think that would be an accurate I way? I think that's say? a very good way to put it, yes, yeah. You uh, don't debate very much. Do you think debate's a waste of time? I don't like debates very much. Uh, I certainly don't like the format where you have, you know, five minutes for the proposition, five minutes for the opposition, rebuttal, rebuttal, uh, and voting and things. It, it smacks of the courtroom, it smacks of the adversarial lawyer approach where uh, guilt or, or non-guilt is established by the eloquence of the advocate for the prosecution or the defense. And the idea is sort of that um, you pay somebody to make the best case they possibly can for this side of the argument and the best case they can for that side of the argument. It's like a kind of tug of war. Um, that's not how scientific disputes should be settled. Is it that style so often seems to win over substance, as far as popular opinion is concerned? Yes, I think that's probably part of it. I mean, that's certainly a problem with courts of law, where famous advocates, famous lawyers become famous because they manage to win cases despite evidence going against them. And that, that seems to me to be rather wicked, that, that, the, that the guilt or innocence of somebody should be determined by the eloquence of the lawyers concerned. I can't think of a better system, but, but it's, not an, it's not a good system. And you hear stories of the sort of legendarily great advocates who even managed to get so-and-so off, although he was quite obviously guilty, that kind of thing. Um, and we, we don't want that in science. That's not the way science uh, should proceed. There's another kind of reason why I don't do debates, which is when the debate is with somebody like a creationist, I mean, a young earth creationist, um, as Stephen Gould, the late Stephen Gould pointed out, they've won the moment you agree to have a debate at all, because that's what they want. What they want is the oxygen of respectability. They want to be seen on a platform with a real scientist because that conveys the idea that here is a genuine argument between scientists. And uh, w w they may not necessarily win the argument, in fact, they, they won't win the argument, but uh, it, it makes it look as though there really is an argument to be had. And so just as I wouldn't expect a gynecologist 
to have a debate with somebody who believed in the stork theory of reproduction. Um, I won't do debates with young earth creationists. Now they can turn that on its ear and bait you by saying, Richard Dawkins Doesn't refuses to, debate. Yeah, 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 I know. You know, coward yes, atheist yes. refuses to have a chair on stage, and that has happened in the past. Well, I've even had somebody put an empty chair on the stage. I mean, that was a bizarre experience when, when I, I simply refused, as I always do. Um, and so he put an empty chair on the, on, on the stage as though I had somehow chickened out of that debate when I never, I mean, as, as I pointed out, um, I think the empty chair was in Oxford. I said, not only did I not debate him in Oxford, I didn't debate him in London, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Bristol, Cardiff, etc. Well, people like to use your name in all manner of, I mean, that's gotta be an odd thing. People drop your name at atheist events left and right. Hell, I'm guilty of it. I'm gonna be interviewing Richard Dawkins this week and it's a big moment for me. Is it odd for you to be the world's most popular atheist? Well, I get embarrassed by that kind of thing. And we come back to your first question about, about the embarrassment of writing an autobiography. You're one of the four horsemen. You know, it's an odd feeling, probably. I'm, I feel honored to be bracketed with Christopher Hitchens, Daniel Dennett, and Sam Harris. Uh, yes. Does it ever bother you that they start with atheist instead of scientist? Yes, it does. I, th I think that's unfortunate. Uh, and. Um, Especially, I mean, they often will say rabid atheist or, or something like that, um, or self-confessed atheist, uh, as though nobody would ever say self-confessed Roman Catholic or self-confessed Muslim. You've always been an activist, I would assume, right? I mean, you even protested the Vietnam War. You were at Berkeley, right? Can you describe that part of your life for me? Were you out there on the front lines of the picket sign? Were you marching and shouting and bullhorning and all of that? Or what? I was in my 20s uh, in Berkeley and it was the time of the Vietnam War. And um, my then wife Marion and I took part in many demonstrations. Uh, we were never leaders of it, we were, we were foot soldiers. And we also worked for the campaigns of the, um, the two leading anti-war candidates for the Democratic nomination in 1968 and did a bit, fair bit of sort of, you know, bit, um, volunteer work for those campaigns. It wasn't long after that you went back overseas to Oxford. 76 hits and the selfish gene comes out. Does your life change dramatically? Yes, my life did change with the selfish gene and that's sort of why I, one of the reasons I decided to break my autobiography into two halves. Uh, it, it was a natural break point. Uh, it did change my life. Um, from then on, I suppose my career was dominated by writing books and public understanding of science, whereas before that, my life was dominated by just doing science and teaching it at Oxford. Science sometimes has a storytelling problem, wonderful information that is not palatable to people, that people cannot properly digest, is, it's not useless, but it's an extreme challenge. You seem to have the ability to take scientific information and make it palatable for the rest of us. Do you consider yourself a storyteller? Yes, I think the storytelling aspect of science is important. Uh, and not only for the general public, actually, but in writing scientific papers themselves. I think that uh, scientists could do a better job of writing up their research for their, for their colleagues. I mean, I was, I was once the editor of a scientific journal for, for a spell, Animal Behaviour. And I struggled there to try to persuade people to break away from the standard pattern of a scientific paper, which isn't necessarily the storytelling way of doing it. The standard pattern of a scientific paper is introduction, methods, results, discussion. And that works for many, many cases. But, but sometimes there's a real story going on there where you do an experiment, but for some reason you have a, a reason for doing the experiment and you do it, the results come, you get the results. That stimulates you to do another experiment, which stimulates you to do another experiment. So we've got three, uh, three experiments, each one le leading on from the previous one. Well, I've seen, I indeed was sent papers when I was editor that did this, introduction, Methods one, methods two, methods three. Results one, result, results two, results three. Discussion. That totally loses the storytelling sequence where the results one gave rise to experiment two. I mean, the correct order would be introduction. Methods one, results one, discussion one. Methods two, results two, results two, methods three, etc. I mean, that, that, that's the right way to, to, 
to, or that's a, at least a better way, to put it out as a narrative. It actually has a flow to it. It actually has a logical sequence to it. Um, and you'd be amazed at how many papers fell into that trap of putting all the methods together, all the results together. The magic of reality. It's the story. Yes. It's illustrated. It's pitched as a children's book. I don't think it's really a children's book at all. It's, it's palatable for children. It's, it's great for kids, but it's sort of great for the rest of us. I like to think that. Uh, there's a, there are two versions of it. There's the illustrated version with lovely pictures by Dave McKean. Um, and then there's an, a more or less illustration-free version, uh, paperback. And, and I suppose the illustration-free version is rather more aimed at the adult market. Do you miss teaching? Is this an extension of the classroom for you, the writing, the lectures? It, yes, it is an extension. And, and I, I, I don't exactly miss teaching because I, in, in a way, do a lot of it around the world. I don't any longer tutor at Oxford the way I used to, uh, but I think I still teach. You're not grading papers, that's the good part, right? You're not uh, and, and, no. doing a lot of that type of thing. That's right. But there's something about being able to impart information to be able to see the, the light go off in someone's eyes. Yes, that's true. I mean, I actually prefer teaching adult audiences to students because students take notes. <laughs> and, and you sort of feel, and, and I'm sure that, I mean, certainly when I was a student, I took notes and it more or less made me not think, because I was so busy scribbling. I read that in the book. You yes. said you're not a fan of note-taking. Yes. So I, if I don't have total recall, if I don't have a photographic memory and I'm not taking notes, are you, are you trying to teach me the spirit of whatever it is, the lesson you, I don't think lectures are where you learn um, a whole lot of facts. Uh, I think um, the lecturer is supposed to be standing up there and inspiring you and getting you to think. And you get the facts from books and, and, and nowadays from the internet. Um, I, I don't think you should write down a summary of every sentence that the lecturer utters. It, it, it's no fun for a lecturer seeing nothing but tops of heads and sort of scribbling <laughs> like that. You want to see faces lighting up, as you said, uh, with understanding or looking uncomprehending, in which case you're doing something wrong and you need to think think again about how to express it. You did a speech a few years ago in my home state of Oklahoma, at Oklahoma University. Quite a bit of controversy. It's a Bible Belt state. There's a church on every half block. The name of Jesus is on everyone's lips. There's a Bible on every nightstand. And here comes Richard Dawkins. Do you find that uh, you find picket signs? You find people who are wailing and gnashing of teeth? On the whole, not. I mean, that, that episode in Oklahoma was actually rather exceptional. Uh, usually I get um, rather enthusiastic receptions, especially enthusiastic in the Bible Belt, actually, because of the, the, the way people there feel threatened. I mean, the, the, the minority, and there are a larger minority than many people realize, who come to lectures by people like me and Sam Harris um, and, and Christopher Hitchens, they, they come and they, and they see this large audience of, of like-minded people, and it gives them encouragement. Oklahoma was different, and I don't quite know. Well, no, it wasn't really different. That had exactly. Oklahoma's the same different, all right. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it was, it was, it was exactly that, like that, and it was a very large auditorium. The two particular thing incidents which which stand out in memory, which don't really go against it. Um, there was one state senator in Oklahoma who tried to get me banned, and he did it by the rather inept way of accusing the university of having paid me $30,000 of public funds, um, and, but th which was not true. I mean, and the university didn't pay me a cent. Uh, I did that speech entirely free because I wanted to, to um, I, because I'm an educator and I, I wanted actually to go to the Bible Belt and talk to people. It was my foundation's policy at that time to go to university ve venues and, and, and I would do it, do it free. So. His attack on me completely fell flat. He then attempted to attack the professor who had invited me, uh, which was very unpleasant. And also, at that same meeting in Oklahoma, there was one man who, who stood up and started shouting, you're insulting my Lord and Savior, or something of that sort. And, and, and he was swiftly ejected. Rather to my regret, actually, I'd have, been, I'd have enjoyed um, 
having, having a conversation with him. I guess that does make sense. People who are in largely religious cultures feel like they're holding their breath. They feel like everywhere they go, there's a church on the corner, there's, there's religion everywhere. And to have someone who more lines up with their secular worldview, it's, it's an opportunity to come out and, and be among friends. Be among friends and perhaps notice that you had more friends than you realized. And which I, I regard as a service that I can provide is simply serving as a sort of magnet to bring people so that they won't, may not learn much from listening to me, but they may learn a lot from noticing that they've, that they've got colleagues that they can team up with, with later. And my impression is that they're a lot more numerous than many people realize. And I think that may be a lesson that politicians need to learn, that they don't only have to suck up to the Catholic lobby and the Jewish lobby and this lobby and the that lobby. Um, maybe the non-believers lobby um, is a lot more powerful than they, than they realize. Do you think a secular political party has merit or do you think secularism needs to be prevalent in the existing political system? Secularism is, is built into the American Constitution. Uh, it's a bit of a scandal really that it, that it, it does, that there, there might even be a case for a secular political party. Um, all politicians ought to be secular. It's part of the American Constitution. Even the ones who are religious should not be promoting they religion. They shouldn't be they promoting should. religion as part of their, as part of their uh, gov government um, legislation. God on the money, taking yeah, the oath on the thing. Bible, all of those types of things, totally in conflict with what the Founding Fathers had intended. It is in conflict with the Founding Fathers, certainly. On the other hand, I don't think that necessarily does too much harm in itself. Uh, I mean, God on the money, you might think, I mean, it doesn't do a lot of harm. It does a bit of harm, though. It was pointed out to me at one time from the audience in a, at an atheist conference. People do use the fact that God is on the money as evidence that America is a Christian country. And, th and so that is an evil effect. Well, religion isn't all that prevalent, or at least it's not spoken about as publicly in the UK, and yet you have the Church of England. It, it's a paradox, but it's perhaps not that great a paradox. Um, the Church of England is the official established church. That's got a long history, of course. It goes back to uh, way, way before the, the founding of the American Republic. Um, and if, if we were starting again, um, the, the, the way America was able to start again, uh, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure we wouldn't have an established church. But the fact that we have an established church with the queen as the head of it sort of makes religion boring. And so it kind of doesn't really catch on in the way that it does in America, where because it's unconstitutional to, um, to, to um, bring religion into government, uh, religion has become free enterprise. And therefore can be made much more exciting and, and but you have mega churches and, um, and you know, happy clappy um, dancing in the aisles and things. Speaking of mega churches, you visit Pastor Ted Haggard's mega church in Colorado years ago as part of a documentary. Why were you there? Were you just documenting the phenomenon of the mega church, faith in America? Yes, it was a, a program, a, a program for Channel Four um, about about religion. It was called under protest from the root of all evil, which I didn't want. Um, that was insisted upon by the, um, by the television company. Um, and we visited a mega church, and the one chosen was the, was the Colorado Springs one of, of Ted Haggard. And they allowed you in, welcome, Professor uh, yes, Dawkins? Uh, yes, uh, that's right. And then they threw us out, um, <laughs> Ted Haggard personally threw us out, um, in, uh, in a very ugly scene. Uh, I, I think what happened was that he, he didn't like the tone of the conversation. And then I, what I suspect is that he then went and Googled me and, and um, worked out who I, who I was. I, th I suspect he didn't know. Um, and then we were um, just kind of doing some uh, shots of the, of, of, the, of the area, just round, round about his mega church, just sort of fill, filling in shots. I forget what you guys call it. but. but um, Oh, B-roll shots, B yes. B-roll yes. shots. Um, and suddenly he came, uh, came around in his pickup truck and sort of screeched to a halt and started yelling. He came at you in the truck and, yes. and was so, screaming and out I of the was, window? I was there with the, ca with the cameraman. Uh, and um, and he, he came and, 
and started yelling at, at me. And it was almost as though he tried to run us over. I mean, I don't know whether he really did, but it, it, it looked a bit like it. To see someone take the moral high ground, to look you in the eye and say, don't be arrogant, don't be arrogant. The don't be arrogant thing, what he was talking about was, was not arrogance about, about God. It was, it was arrogance about creationism. I mean, I, I was simply telling him, um, you're simply wrong about the age of the earth, or whatever it was, about, 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 the, about evolution. Um, so, uh, I, it, it, I mean, the, the charge of arrogance might have been sort of justified if I'd been arrogant about his religious beliefs, but I was, being, I was simply being factual about science, um, about which he, he obviously knows nothing. I was given a book by a loved one who was obviously concerned about my immortal soul. And they said, read this, this will help you. And that book was Alistair McGrath's The Dawkins Delusion. This person had not read the book, but it was enough that your name was on the title and it was anti-Dawkins. People seem to consider you the Pied Piper of atheism, where all lemmings following you over the cliff kind of a thing. But that's not the case at all. I mean, people are quick to be skeptical in this movement regarding your work or any, is that correct? Yes, I think it is. And that, that particular book is one of, I think, about 22 books that have come out with various permutations of delusion and God and Dawkins and, and you know, deluded by Dawkins and, and, and God is no delusion. And, and you know, that they're about, I think, I think at last count it was 22 of them. Um, that particular one that, that you mention is very big on saying how strident and arrogant I am. But if you read that book, I mean, did you read it? It's the most astonishingly strident book. Um, the God Delusion is, is a pussycat book by comparison to the, to the vitriol in, in that book by McGraw that you, that you quote. Well, I think it, it speaks to how humble we all should be by truly knowing our place in the cosmos, right? Yes, we yes, are not. And that, I know. Um, but, but, it, it's, he, but he was the last person who had any right to, to criticize somebody for being, um, well, rude. He was, it's an extremely rude book. Do you bother with the majority of these works? Do you browse them? Do you look at no, them? No, I mean, we, we had on, on our website, richarddawkins.net, we had a section called Fleas. Uh, it, it comes from a poem by W.B. Yeats. <laughs> oh, with the parasites living off yeah, the animal? Yes, that's right. I mean, what, but, but was there ever dog that praised his fleas? Um, I wonder if I can remember the full quote. Um, you say, as I have often given tongue in praise of what another said or sung, to a politic to do the like by these. But was there ever dog that praised his fleas? I know you've written many, many books. Do you read still, and what do you read? Uh, well, I, I read science, obviously. Um, I, I read um, novels. I like um, satirical, I like modern satirical novels. Um, witty observations of, of um, the, the way people are. Well, what do you do de to decompress if you are always on the go, you're being pawed at left and right, you're traveling continents, you're, you're speaking every five minutes. I just saw you on The Daily Show a couple of days ago. What do you do to decompress and unwind? Well, um, I suppose much the same as what most people do. Um, I've, I've just been presented with a, a musical instrument, which I haven't really touched since I was a boy. When I, I played the clarinet as a, as a boy, and then haven't played it since. And I've been given a, an iwi, which is, uh, an, it stands for electronic wind instrument. And uh, you blow into it, and you play it like a clarinet, which I used to play, uh, or like a saxophone. I mean, it's the same kind of fingering, or like a flute or an oboe. Um, and it plugs into computer, and the noise that comes out depends on what you tell the computer. It would come out as a clarinet, or a trumpet, or a tuba, or a violin, or a cello. Um, but because it's a, a wind instrument, um, you can get expression. So uh, you, you blow it as a clarinet, and it sounds like a clarinet. And if you go t -t -t, it sounds like a, like a clarinet would. If you do play it as a cello, um, and you go t -t, you get the kind of zing that the bow makes on a cello. And if you go nice, sort of legato, you get the beautiful, smooth cello sound. Uh, if you play it as a trumpet, uh, then you get that nice blaring sound. But you, um, but then if you go, tuh, 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 
you get the sort of lippy sound that, that, a, that a trumpet gives. It's the most amazing thing. So you get the nuance of the acoustic exactly. instrument. Exactly, you get the nuance of the acoustic and um, very, very cunningly, they've managed to link it up to breath and lips and tightness of, of, of what's called embouchure um, uh, and, and tailored it to the particular um, instrument that comes. Of course, you have to play it properly. I mean, you have to, you know, your fingers have to know what they're, what they're doing and having played the clarinet 50 years ago helps. Did I see you play this instrument on stage? Yes. Uh, the, the people who gave it to me were the advertising firm Saatchi and Saatchi. And they got me to do a sort of um, film, a little bit of film for them for promotional purposes. Uh, and they filmed me giving a lecture in the first place about memes, only a three minute lecture. And then they took phrases from my lecture and incorporated those phrases into a sort of amazing, surreal light show. With psychedelic. In, psychedelic <laughs> images yeah. and pictures of me whirling round and round and things. Um, and my voice distorted in sort of quasi-musical ways. And then finally at the end, um, I, I walked on the stage with the, with the iwi and played, um, played the tune which, had, which was, was, was running at the end of this, of this light show. What was the response? The video was so different and so odd and out there and amazing. And... I don't really know. Well, I think the response was reasonably favorable. Um, it was, I think people were a bit... It was a departure for you. I mean, you were used yes. to giving lecture and all of a sudden you came out and you did this live musical yes. performance. Yes. I mean, it, it, it sort of looked a bit miraculous that they were able so quickly to, um, to uh, incorporate phrases from my lecture into this light show. And obviously, the way we did it was that I gave the lecture in a, in a studio before, I mean, months before. And I had to, it had to be word for word the same as I was going to give it on, on stage. Um, so they had plenty of time to pick up phrases and, uh, and, and musicify them. You mentioned the word meme. I just want to thank you for that. Thank you for introducing meme to our common language. You are now responsible for the naming and branding of countless kitten posters. <laughs> so I'm told, but yes. And celebrities. It's, it's, and Yes, okay. Um, where did, the, did you just make it up? Does it stand for something, the word meme? No, oh, it, it, it comes from the first edition of The Selfish Gene, uh, and it's a... It doesn't exactly rhyme with gene, but it's sort of meant to sound a bit like gene, and it's the cultural equivalent of a gene. And the, the, the purpose of it was to dispel the idea that, that genes are everything, because the rest of the book, The Selfish Gene, does rather leave the reader with the impression that you, ha you can't do natural selection, you can't do evolution without, without genes. The truth is you can't do natural selection without some kind of copied information, which is what genes are, self-replicating information. I wanted to emphasize that point by uh, finding another example of copied information. And a meme, the unit of cultural inheritance, is just another example of a DNA-like entity which makes copies of itself, in this case by imitation, uh, rather than by chemical replication. May we take a moment and talk about Christopher Hitchens? I know you were friends. I have this image of the embrace at the Texas Free Thought Convention right before he died. What impact did his death have on you? Well, it was a tragedy. He was, he was an immensely eloquent, likable man, uh, probably the most eloquent orator I ever heard in the flesh, um, and immensely charming, hugely erudite, seemed to have a photographic memory for uh, all sorts of important facts that he could pull out. Did he share with you what was going on in his mind and heart during the latter stages of his illness? Not really. I was never a very close friend, to my regret. I, I didn't know him um, in his younger days the way his very close friends did. Um, I interviewed him at some length for New Statesman, a British political magazine, uh, shortly before his death. In fact, the day before that um, meeting with the, with the embrace that you you refer to. And that was a long interview, and he did um, tell me lots of things. It was, a, it was a very personal interview, and we had dinner together afterwards. Of course, we watch Christopher's story, and we're all having the conversation about our own mortality. Do you have those thoughts about, you know, what do I want in my memorial service? Do yes. I fear death? Those that, types of that things. That kind of thing, yes. Do you fear uh, death? I fear eternity. 
uh, I think eternity is a very is a is an alarming concept. Richard, you you can live forever. That's not attractive to you. <laughs> no, um, eternity is a very frightening idea, and I think it's even more frightening if you're there than if you're not. Um, and so uh, the way I've put this is that I want to spend eternity under a general anaesthetic. <laughs> is it that? The endlessness of it makes it meaningless. Less meaningless is just it's just the endlessness itself. I mean, just going on and on and on and on. It's like the the, the infinity of space being being frightening. I mean, while our brains aren't built to cope with it. You've been called one of the new atheists. I don't get this. I don't know that there's anything new that's being discussed. No, I, I don't think there is. Uh, I, I think there's there's nothing that we've said that isn't in, for example, Bertrand Russell. Um, I suppose we're only new in that we are coming out and speaking frankly and not being intimidated into thinking that religion deserves a kind of free pass and shouldn't be, um, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be criticized. You're simply raising a hand of opposition, right? It's a response to a very proactive religious message. It's a response to that. It's a response to the prevailing view. That, that religion is somehow immune to criticism in the way that politics, sport, theater, books, music are not. Tell me about The Unbelievers. This is a film that, that made by um, Lawrence Krauss, the physicist, and me. Uh, it's an unusual film because it consists mostly of conversation between Lawrence and me. The conversations were held in various places, usually in front of an audience, not always, in various parts of the world, like Sydney Opera House uh, or uh, London or, or various parts of America. Um, the producers have rather cleverly woven together fragments of these different conversations so that they, they've eliminated the duplication and produced uh, a finished product which has been much praised by the critics who've seen it, uh, that so far been shown, I think, only in sort of premiered, which it was premiered at, at, in Toronto, at a Toronto festival, and was extremely well received there. Um, it will be released, not quite sure when. This is not just a, a video documentary, this is a feature film, an actual It's a feature, feature. film. Uh, it may or may not be released at, um, on sort of general release in cinemas. It probably won't be very widely distributed there. It may, fi it may end up being on I'm not sure what Netflix is, but, uh, but I'm told that that's a place where it may be, uh, perhaps in universities, uh, perhaps in arts theatres, that kind of thing. Let's finish with the autobiography. You are telling the story of, of you, and in some ways you're telling the story of science. When people open the cover, what will they discover? They'll discover a, an, an honest and frank life of one individual. Uh, I think that if they think I am an uh, aggressive, strident person, they might be surprised. I think it's, it's quite a gentle book. It's, a, it's kind to most of the people mentioned. It's kind to my, most of my teachers. Uh, it, it's, um, uh, I think it's a friendly book. Um, I think it portrays me the way I really am. Uh, not totally, perfectly, but um, in, in a better way than, than has been perhaps believed by people who've read things at second hand. People who are eager to label you as one thing or another. This is a more three-dimensional view of Richard Dawkins. I'd like to think so. I want to say that uh, I came from religion personally. I was a Christian broadcaster. I was neck deep in Christianity. I'd never before heard the Christian position truly challenged, and I'd never been exposed to real science. And when I was 37, I opened The God Delusion. It was the third book in a series of books that changed my life. And I promised myself I wasn't going to come and fawn and paw at you and say, you changed my life. I'm breaking that promise. Richard Dawkins, your work changed my life. I have. I have no idea if the work I do today would exist if it hadn't been for that time when I opened the God delusion and I couldn't turn the pages fast enough. Now, you may not have seen that picture when you were writing it, but you probably hear stories like that all the time. People send you letters and they say, 
I had never thought of it in this way before, and I found myself nodding in agreement. Yes, finally it makes perfect sense. You must get mail like that left and right, yes? I can't tell you how delighted I am to hear you say that, and I actually do get it from quite a lot of people, not just letters, but especially in signing cues on book tours like I'm on at present. And there are some who actually have been deconverted by me. And there are others who have already, as it were, set out on the path to deconversion, and, and they tell me that my book has helped them to find the courage to go, to go along that path. And you think in 10 years, 15 years, hell, even two years, do you see sort of the profile, the demographic of the nuns, the non-believers in this country starting to really surge? Do you see a difference being made? Well, the, the trend is in the right direction. I think it's up to about 22% now. Uh, and I suspect there'll be a tipping point uh, when the, the numbers become too great and too well, widely known to be ignored. And at that point, politicians are going to to stop making the assumption. And it's inconceivable when you think about it that, that all 535 members of the US Congress <laughs> are religious believers. <laughs> and that's just statistically not on. And so um, they, they need more courage than many because they're frightened of losing votes. And there will come a tipping point when they're, they're no longer frightened of losing votes, or they may be frightened of losing the votes of the nuns, as you said, the, the nuns. Yeah, the non, the nuns, I do the yes, same thing, yeah. yes. Um, and, and so I look forward to that time. I think it'll go very suddenly when it does. I wish you the best with the book, An Appetite for Wonder. It's the first of two parts, yes? Yes. And the second part is due when? Uh, 2015. I hope it opens doors into um, a better understanding of you and your work. I do wish you all success and thank you for your wonderful work, sir. Thank you very much.